the tragic scene of two tangled cars and a woman's screams called for action. I couldn't open the door to get to those that were screaming. I flagged the car, then finally someone stopped. We sent for help. The woman couldn't be moved, and her teenage daughter was trapped in the rear seat. Her leg bone was protruding through the skin. We broke the glass from the rear window, and although dazed, the girl would scream when touched. In the other car, all was silent. Inside were four Negro men, all dead, killed instantly and crushed together from the smashed inside. An ambulance came in surprisingly soon. The woman's husband, Elmer Ward, finally arrived. What a tearful re reunion. The Ward girl and her mother were gently removed amid pleas and screams. They did recover. The Negroes returning from fishing for carp on the Bear River made a sudden unexpected left turn and were struck broadside by the Ward car. One beautiful spring day, while eating my lunch near the Highline Canal in about the year 1960, I heard repeated cries far away. And jumping to my feet, I ran to the canal bank and eastward, around the bend and along the canal. Then I saw in the distance something struggling in the full canal of water and children running alongside screaming. I ran at top speed. Coming closer to the scene, I at last could see what it was all about. I dropped exhausted, my heart pounding. I was weak all over. The children cried, get him out, get him out. But it was their dog, almost finished, hardly struggling anymore. I grabbed Gene by the feet and he reached over into the water and after several tries caught the dog by the collar and pulled the helpless creature from the water. Elaine was so happy she took the big wet dog in her arms. I said, who's that on the canal bridge way back there, a quarter of a mile away? Oh, it's our little baby brother, they said. Challenges have always attracted my attention. If something new that shows possibilities that to improve the existing methods appears, I become quite excited. I like large scale or specialized producing. Growing things or trying something different stirs up that inward urge to become involved. To get ahead financially, one must jump, but should plan to land on his feet. Landing on your head can certainly create some frustrations. I haven't considered myself a speculator, but past performances that have, I've been involved in certainly may tend to argue otherwise. While teaching school, my first year in 1932 in the North Ogden Junior High School, a man who was involved in dredging for gold on the Green River approached members of the faculty. He urged each one to invest in a new and improved method of dredging for gold on the Green River. His sales pitch with photographs of this particular operation did gain some interest. Florence Manning, a teacher that was known to have previously invested in most everything, she immediately subscribed to some stock. I had no money, but did invite him to come to my home. We were then living in the Reese home with Mildred's father. After this man's presentation, 
that night, her father, R.T. Reese, said to him, if you have proven methods of doing what you say and you need investors, why don't you go to Salt Lake City where there are agents paid to invest an unlimited amount of other people's money into worthwhile, safe enterprises? Well, within a short time, this man gave up his chances of extracting an investment of money from a wise man who had already, through his own experiences of investing, learned important lessons from speculation. R.T. Reese, although considered well-educated and a wise man, had lost money, invested in such things as rubber and banana plantations. I've never forgotten this Green River incident and valuable lesson, but it is embarrassing to admit that in certain instances I have set aside that valuable lesson and just and just had to do some first-hand learning for myself. Well, true to the stories of life's hard-earned lessons, it certainly they certainly are sometimes costly. In 1966, I invested $8,000 of hard-earned money in the foremost finance company in Ogden, Utah. It was organized and operated by James Deemer, and it made great gains for the first two years. But Jim, Jim Deemer, he experienced family problems, and he certainly adopted for himself unorthodox actions. And in 1968, the business began to experience a non-profit status. Well, as a member of the board of directors, I refused to give him a vote of confidence in the management of the business. I could see the course of disaster ahead and wanted to sell out my stock. The company couldn't buy the stock due to its instability and lack of funds. Well, I sort of gave Jim a constant bad time, saying to him that anyone could invest our revolving capital, even in a bank, and return some profitable dividends to the stockholders. Somewhat, some way, uh, Jim, Jim Deemer raised the money and offered me 50% of my initial investment to get me out. This I gladly accepted. I was happy to get this offer. In the years following, the company folded up, and the other stockholders received very little from their initial investment. Knowing of the fabulous growth of the Lincoln Life Insurance Company over the years, and the great returns to the original best investors, I became interested in the newly organized Majestic Life Insurance Company. Its home office was in Salt Lake City and was organized by, well, reputable good men, we thought. I invested $3,000. The company reported good growth for the first few years. Well, it overexpanded and then merged with other insurance companies and finally became insolvent and the investors received nothing. We sold fruit to a prominent businessman in Blackfoot, Idaho. One season he offered me some Gold Ridge uranium stock for two large loads of fruit. Well, I had no previous desire to get uranium stock. I was quite skeptical of, of that. But this seemed a practical way to become involved without too much invested by me. This man by the name of Peterson was president of the Gold Ridge Mining Company and was a wealthy and ambitious owner of businesses and ranches in and near the town of Blackfoot, Idaho. In his efforts to force the successful operation of Gold Ridge uranium mines, Mr. Peterson finally lost all of his lands and businesses and ended up, ended up in failure. I was glad that my involvement amounted to only a couple of loads of fruit. 
and certainly didn't uh, threaten my survival. In the 1960s, I invested heavily in mutual funds. They seemed the way to go for the inexperienced investor. So one time I held stock in about 20 mutual funds. At that time, I built the self-service gas station at Monroe and 28th Street in 1966 in Ogden. I felt I should retire these funds and reinvest into something more tangible. This same year, I cashed in most of the funds and used the money to pay for this gas station. And right soon after this, stocks and bonds on the listed market were certainly feeling the effects of a recession. I was glad that I had sold when I did, with no mutual fund losses. The mutual fund of $5,000 with investors diversified services I kept for a time. And later I exchanged it for, for um, Mc, Mc, uh, McCullough oil stock, which at that time supported a big operation showing much promise at that time. In the many years since then, it has experienced many dry oil holes and in 1976, I was offered a settlement of less than $5 for my total stock, which cost me originally $5,000. I was hounded by a local broker to, in Ogden to invest in stock in the Property Trust of America. I finally subscribed to $3,000 worth of stock. This uh, company obtains property and bills for hotels and marketing companies, and then leases these out to various companies and chains. As of 1979, it is paying a small dividend to its stockholders. For a period of time, I had considerable holdings of uh, listed stocks on the market exchange. Ford Motor, Ludlow Carpets, Singer, and others did well. But I did buy high, and I finally sold high, which rewarded me with no actual profits and averaged out with really no losses. I had feared an economic downtrend, which really did happen. The most profitable money investments I've made have been with my son, David. Loans to him and stocks I've taken have steadily paid off as agreed. Never has there been a default or late return. The $5,000 invested in Grand Valley Partners has yet to be proven as a profitable one, but does show some promise. In summary, my advice to the novice, or the beginner, is this. A person should become involved in pure speculation only, only when he can afford to lose what is involved. A home is a necessity that can legitimately be identified as a necessary non-speculative investment, providing that the terms are reasonable and the price is right. It should, however, be modest and free from unnecessary luxuries that would place the buyer in a state of questionable financial bondage. Diversified investments can ease or actually avoid the negative impact of a single non-profitable investment. Reliable institutions are historically more sound, or most sound. Does your investment earn? Is it safe? Is it liquid or available to so that you can recapture your money upon demand? In times of financial uncertainties, it is better that your invest investments be in land, or gold and silver, or income property, or equipment. In times of uncertainty, a person really should move away from all paper securities. 
Whenever you can personally control your investments, your chances of successes are greatly determined by yourself. Non-personal control means that you are at the mercy of others who may not even lose as you hold the risk of doing. For me, good examples of personal control have been in the farm, in the honeybee business, service stations, car wash, and land parcels. Income and profits are more sure when your businesses earn for you, whether or not you're present. Fruit on the trees mature when their needs that you have to provide are given to them, and honey bees gather honey if their needs are met, even when at times you're not present. If you want to know how fast the months really come and go, just get into debt. If you want to feel the real bondage and the burden and worry of debt, just become indebted to your maximum capacity. Now, if you want the thrill of security and freedom from worry, family strives, and the impairment of your health, save something every month with never an, except, an exception. I am grateful that my parents taught their children to work. We didn't work by the hour, we worked by the job to get the job done. We seldom received any money, but at the end of the year we were given some money to give to the bishop so that our names would be in the tithing books. Money was scarce, so we didn't see much of it, but we knew it would be found for some important things such as music lessons and and missions. Any systematic financial planning then seemed to be known in uh, such terms as just having a general goal and then to really work hard. Surprisingly enough, this simple procedure brought about some unusual results. However, throughout the history of the Church, Personal and family preparedness has been emphasized by our leaders. In more recent years, great importance has repeatedly been directed to spiritual, financial, health, career, and educational preparedness. And since financial matters have a profound impact upon happiness and a well-ordered home, in its, it is imperative today that we minimize financial fears. Now, to do this we must attain, then maintain, financial preparedness. The Lord has outlined a simple formula to follow. Pay your tithes and offerings, get out of debt and stay out of debt. Regularly save something for future unexpected needs and use your surplus funds wisely. The Lord has revealed to us that this is the day for tithing of my people. And you find that in the Doctrine and Covenants, the 64th section and the 23rd verse. Compliance with the law of tithing opens the windows of heaven, bringing material and spiritual blessings through sacrifice and obedience. Tithe payers are blessed and prospered spiritually, physically, and mentally as well as materially. The Lord said in section 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the 35th verse, Release thyself from bondage. Now, be financially and spiritually free. Live within your income. Follow a well-ordered budget and regularly save a part of your income. It is good to establish credit, but use your credit wisely if it is necessary to use it at all. Preserve your assets and savings through appropriate tax and estate 
planning. President Heber J. Grant said, quote, if there is any one thing that will bring peace and contentment into the human heart and into the family, it is to live within our means. If there is any one thing that is grinding and discouraging and disheartening, it is to have debts and obligations that one cannot meet." Unquote. Use your surplus funds wisely. A real test of a man is his attitude towards earthly possessions. A person who places earthly possessions in the scales against the things of God shows little understanding of eternal values. Brigham Young said, quote, When our people are prepared to properly use the riches of this world for the building up of the kingdom of God, he is ready and willing to bestow them upon us. I like to see, a man, like to see men get rich by their industry, prudence, management, and economy and then devote it to the building up of the kingdom of God upon the earth." Unquote. This is from his Journal of Discourses. Abraham Lincoln said that if you want to really break a man down, just get him into debt. This can ruin the man, his hopes, and his health more effectively than can anything else. Of all the men who have contributed in great measure to the blessing and wisdom of mankind, Abraham Lincoln, in my judgment, would stand out as one of the greatest. Here are a few quotes from this great American. He said, I don't know who my grandfather was. I am much more concerned to know what his grandson will be. I don't think much of a man who is not wiser today than he was yesterday. All that I am or hope to be I owe to my angel mother. I remember her prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon the earth and be an atheist, but I cannot conceive how he could look into the heavens and say, there is no God. All things most desirable for man's welfare here and hereafter are to be found in the Bible. My constant prayer is that I and the nation may be on the Lord's side. I am always for the man who wishes to work. In this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all, and to the young it comes with bitterest agony because it takes them unawares. The older have learned to ever expect it. I desire so to conduct the affairs of this administration that if at the end I have lost every other friend on earth, I shall at least have one friend left, and that friend shall be down inside of me. Die when I may. I want it said of me by those who know me best that I plucked a thistle and planted a flower when I thought a flower would grow. It is true that you may fool all the people some of the time. You can even fool some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. When one is embarrassed, usually the shortest way to get through with it is to quit talking or thinking about it and go at something else. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Universal idleness would speedily result in universal ruin. 
I believe each individual is naturally entitled to do as he pleases with himself and the fruits of his labors, so far as it is in no wise interferes with any other man's rights. No man living are more worthy to be trusted than those who toil up from poverty, and there are none less inclined to take or touch that which they have not earnestly earned. Leave nothing for tomorrow which can be done today. Character is like a tree and reputation like its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. With some, the, with some, the world liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor while with others the same word, liberty, may mean for some men to do as they please with the other men and the product of the other men's labor. One is truly liberty, the other tyranny. I laugh because I must not cry, he said. Calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Falsehood is the worst enemy you can have, especially if you have a bad memory. I could as easily bail out the Potomac River with a teaspoon as attend to all the details of the army. When I'm getting ready for a debate, I spend one third of my time thinking about what I am going to say and two-thirds about what my opponent will say. He reminds me of a man who murdered both his parents, then pleaded for mercy on the grounds that he was an orphan. The Lord prefers common-looking people. That's the reason he made so many of them. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. Without the assistance of that divine being, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to the finish, to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. I can make a brigadier general in five minutes, but it is not easy to replace a hundred and ten horses. It is not best to swap horses while crossing a stream. The foregoing are quotes from that great, great man, Abraham Lincoln. I believe we would have a greater America 